William Alston provides a defense of the divine command theory in his article, What Euthyphro Should Have Said. Now, Alston isn't explicating the divine command theory, so he's not particularly endorsing one and trying to make sure that it's clear what that theory is and giving arguments for it. Instead, here his project is defensive. He is arguing that objections, the classic objection, especially against the divine command theory, fails. So let's take a little consideration of the divine com command theory that he is considering. The idea is that divine commands are constitutive of moral obligation. So that term is somewhat technical here in this context. What we mean when we say something is constitutive of something, something else, so if A is constitutive of B, that means A is essential to B, and A makes B what it is. So when we're talking about moral obligations in the context of the divine command theory, it's divine commands that make moral obligations what they are. And the divine commands are essential to moral obligations. So if there were no divine commands, there would be no moral obligation. So that's the view that we have. Obligation then is to be understood to include the idea of oughtness, how we ought to behave, what we ought to do, to use a made up word there. Uh, so Alston is exploring the idea that divine commands are what provide the obligatory aspect to moral principles. What makes something obligatory for us to do? Now, DCT here stands for divine command theory. So he's exploring the idea that divine commands are what provide that obligatory aspect. And one is morally obligated to tell the truth. If that's a, an obligation that we have, this implies that God commands one to tell the truth. So that is going to be true for any obligation one is obligated to assist those in need would mean that God commands us to assist those in need. Okay, the Euthyphro. The Euthyphro is a name of a character in a book by Plato called the Euthyphro, and technically Alston is not considering Euthyphro's actual challenge in Plato's work, because that had to do with polytheism for one, and the concern with piety, not divine commands, for another. So he's not technically trying to give a historical view on what Euthyphro should have said, right? So he, he is aware of that, he states that straight up front. What he's doing is he's providing a response that is very similar and inspired by the Euthyphro dialogue where Socrates raises a dilemma that is a concern for today for someone who is a monotheist. And the challenge then, the dilemma that is raised for a contemporary theist is a problem then if you have especially a divine command theory of a theistic ethic. So here's the dilemma, the Euthyphro dilemma put in our contemporary context where we're concerned about monotheism. Either one, we ought to do an action because God commands us to do that action, or two, God commands us to do A because it's good that we should do A. And then the dilemma follows through on, identifies problems for a theist with, of course, taking either of these options that are forced, or at least supposed to be forced. And so what Alston is doing is he's carrying through, talking through what how to respond, how a theist might respond to these two horns 
of the dilemma. First of all, let's make sure that we consider the challenges. So the first horn there, the idea that we ought to do A because God commands us to do A, faces actually two significant challenges. And we're going to focus for the rest of this first part, part one, on the first horn. And so what are the challenges? The challenges are twofold. A, it seems to make God's commands arbitrary. And if, if they're arbitrary, then of course, moral obligations would be arbitrary. And that seems to be very problematic. Uh, we, anything God would command then would become obligatory. So we would raise the question, for example, could God command engaging in cruelty for its own sake? Or, you know, could God command that we do something else that all of us agree is morally wrong? Now, in, in responding to this, of course, if one says that we ought to do A because God commands us to do A, you can't appeal to any moral standard that would restrict God's commands because the moral standards are based in God's commands. So you can't say something like, well, it would be wrong uh, to engage in cruelty for its own sake because that's something that we identify as wrong so that God wouldn't command that, right? That, that is problematic. You can't make that appeal. That's not open to the theists. Okay, so let's think through this first horn, the other concern that might be raised. And, and that is that it makes the idea that God is good seemingly vacuous. Now, of course, God be, could be good in a metaphysical sense, right? Uh, very knowledgeable being good, right? All knowledgeable, all powerful, uh, that would be good. But we're talking about the moral sense here, of course. And if it's said that God is good in a moral sense, then it would just mean that God obeys his own commands, and that would be vacuous. So Alston proposes in his response that we, if we address this concern, the, the part B of the first horn of the dilemma, and have a sufficient challenge or sufficient response to this challenge, that's going to provide us with our concern about the commands being arbitrary. So how do we do that? What is the response? One way of doing this is to say that we restrict moral obligations under consideration to those only that apply to creatures other than God. So those that apply to humans, but not to God. And that could be because God's, the commands of God are binding on us, right, because of God's supremacy. So that would be a distinction. Now, in any case, one might argue that moral obligations could not possibly apply to God. They couldn't apply to God for the same reasoning that, that Kant uses. Alston borrows Kant's reasoning in this option. Why couldn't they apply to God? Because God is perfectly rational. And if someone, in, in Kant's perspective, right, if someone is perfectly rational, then there's no possibility of going against what's morally right. And so if God is perfectly rational, rational, there's no possibility of going against what's morally right. So there are no moral obligations on God. Let's, let's think through this more carefully. Why would we say there are no obligations if there's no possibility against, uh, of God doing against, going against what's right? Well, well let's consider this nat nature of obligation. The notion of obligation only applies in those situations where is it at, where it is at least possible that one does not conform. You don't have to have rules where there's no possibility of violating the rule. You don't have to have rules where there's an extremely low likelihood 
of violating a rule. So we don't need a rule against, say, using transporters on campus, right? Uh, there, no one uses transporters. They're simply not available, right? So I don't put on my syllabus that students have to obey the law of gravity while they're seated in class, right? I don't have to regulate that because no one's going to violate it, right? So whenever there's an obligation, there's this idea that there's a sense of a possibility that someone not follow through. So if God's perfectly rational and perfectly good, then there's no possibility that he's going to go against a moral law. And so there really is no obligation on him. So uh, in summary of the response to the first torn, then uh, we have four things to consider. First of all, we take the idea that moral obligations are in fact grounded in divine commands. That is what we are obligated to do, what God commands. But no type of morally ought commands, no obligations, morally speaking, apply to God. He's not the kind of being that could disobey or fail to follow those, and so they don't apply. And the goodness of God, then, does not consist in doing what he ought to do as required by his commands. So that means the claim that God is good is not vacuous, right? God is good. That is, he has the characteristics that are considered morally good, and the same characteristics that are in creatures who can disobey. That is, being loving, being just, being merciful. Now, of course, we don't mean the exact same way. We, we would borrow uh, Aquinas's idea of analogical language here. So when we say a human is loving, that might look a little different than saying that God is loving, and likewise with being just or merciful. But we can say that God is good, and God is loving, and God is just and merciful, because we can understand those features in humans and analogously identify God as having those features as well. And not only that, right, he has those features essentially. So the divine command theory does not rule out the moral goodness of God. It, it would still make sense for us to call him morally good and also claim that his commands are not arbitrary. So in this sense, we've fulfilled the uh, task of responding to both of our challenges. We've, we've addressed both A and B. So in responding to B, in explaining why claiming that God is good is not vacuous, we've also then provided an explanation of why it is that God's commands are not arbitrary. Okay, one last uh, concern here is to revisit that first horn, the idea that we ought to do A because God commands us to do A, and that makes uh, the commands of God arbitrary or vacuous. Um, let's think about this possibility uh, one more time here. Um, what if God commanded sacrificing everything for acquiring power, for example? Uh, what about that possibility? Well, Alston says that since God is perfectly good by nature, Right? It is in God's nature, it is essential to him that he is perfectly good. It wouldn't be possible for God to make such a command. Right? You, God could not do it because of his essential, morally perfect nature, as I hinted earlier. Now, it might depend on how one handles subjective conditionals here with impossible antecedents. Counterfactuals with impossible antecedents are sometimes uh, challenging to figure out how we should respond to those. 
So how should we respond if I were to say something like, if I were Superman, I would fix the economy somehow? You know, it just, how, do you, how do you think through the truth of that conditional when it's impossible that I am Superman, right? The important thing here is that there's no chance of the antecedent being true. So there's no chance of God commanding sacrificing everything for acquiring power or being cruel for cruelty's own sake or something like that. That's not possible because it would go against God's essential nature of being perfectly good. Now, we're going to pick up on the second horn, that concern that God commands us to do A because it's good that we should do A, and that would seem to imply that there's some standard of goodness apart from God. We're going to pick that up in part two.